Um, awesome. Yeah, so let's get started. Um, I wanted to kick off this talk by just discussing a little bit what it means to be a senior engineer. Because um, I'm sure that a lot of you have that question in the crowd, and it's a it's a difficult thing to answer. Um, most people that I talk to who are you know kind of entering uh, you know the first phases of their career, who are really driven to kind of move up um, in positions, they often want like a bullet list of items that like what do I need to do in order to become a senior engineer? Um, and it's you know it's never that easy to pull that together. Um, but what most people gravitate towards is a lot of the technical aspects of that, right? I need to know these libraries. I need to know Ruby. I need to know all these different things, uh, which is definitely really important. But I think if you were to talk to a lot of people who are in an engineering leadership position, um, they say like, yes, that's that's important for sure. Um, but it's really only like one part of the big picture of what it means to be a senior engineer. And that's what I'm going to kind of delve into today. So for me, when I'm hiring um, senior engineers, a big portion of it is I want to see that they understand that they can't do everything themselves. Like most software these days is built by teams of people. Um, very few pieces of software are built by individuals these days. Um, and when you're working with a team of people and you're senior and you really you know, have a lot of knowledge in that area, your primary role becomes actually like leveling the team up and spreading that knowledge that you have. And that's really, really important to the job description of a senior engineer. Um, and it's not something that we always talk about. Um, so I really wanted to, to dive into that today with you guys. So how, does, um, you know, how do you start leveling up a team of engineers? Uh, you do that by teaching. Um, and teaching becomes a bigger, bigger role um, and a bigger kind of driver in your career as you move further into the engineering discipline. Um, and you have to become a really good teacher because you want to learn how to have a big impact on your team. Being a senior engineer is all about having impact. Um, like, you can't write all of the code yourself. You need to work with the people around you, and you can have a much bigger impact on the code base by teaching them all to become better coders um, and spreading that knowledge around. So, like, it's, it's all about becoming a high-impact engineer. That's why they pay you the big bucks as a senior engineer. Um, it's because they can pull you onto a team, and you're going to make a huge difference into, you know, all of the code that the team is producing, not just the code that you write yourself. So teaching is going to become a big part of your career as you move forward. Um, and I want to kind of provide some guidance here today about how to do that. So um, I'm guessing most people in this room did not go to school to become a teacher. Anybody? Ah, oh, damn, I thought some boot campers. All right, there we go. We got one. Nice. <laughs> Um, I didn't go to school to become a teacher. I, I went to school to become a coder. Um, and I get this you know, from a lot of new engineers. They're like, how am I supposed to have all these teaching skills? Like, how am I supposed to do this? Um, it's you know, something that I'd like to tackle today, because when I did it, I learned it by trial and error. Um, and I, you know, I, I'm hoping to provide a lot of those lessons learned to you guys today. Um, my background is you know, really from computer engineering. Um, I started in that in university. Started working for Maven Link um, pretty much right out of college. Uh, and that team does exclusively pair programming. Uh, so I learned really quickly how to teach and how to like, start talking to people on a daily basis. And I moved up through my career at Maven Link and got into team lead positions where it was my entire job to level up the team and to deliver the features that we had. So that became even more of a focus for me. Now I'm a director of engineering and I've got to level up teams of teams. So it's even more of a focus. And it's a particular like, area of learning that I'm really interested in. Also used to be an ex-shy person, really super shy in high school. And it took a lot to like, learn how to get up in front of people and teach them something. So I want to kind of, you know, that's my background, show that to you today. And definitely let you know that anyone can do this. Anyone can teach. And I'm hoping to kind of help you get there. Cool. So the game plan for today. Uh, I've got eight lessons that I've learned over the course of five years working in engineering and trying to level up all the engineers around me. I'm hoping it's all going to be helpful. We're going to go through each lesson at a time um, and see how it applies to um, engineering teams. So digging right in. First thing I learned with working with teams of engineers is that a question from someone on your team is a huge opportunity for growth for that person. 
Um, there's a lot more potential to a question than what most people give it. And I'll kind of like dig, dig in and show you what I mean by that. So like for most people, you go to work, you're sitting at your desk, you're jamming on some code, you're probably concentrating, maybe you have the headset on, you're like really focused. And at some point, someone's gonna come by and interrupt you and ask you a question. Maybe they have a blocker, maybe something's you know, causing error, maybe bundlers being a pain in the butt, um, maybe something's happening, and they're trying to get some information from you because maybe you're the most experienced in that area, you, know, you need to help. What do most people do in these types of situations? Right? If you were to think of like a response to that, what do most people respond? <laughs> Or this, this is worse. Um, they, you know, I fixed it, merged into master, you're good to go. Um, they basically never answer the, the question. They never really you know, tell the person you know, what was happening. They didn't give them information or background on what's going on. Um, and this is really common for a lot of engineers because they want to focus on what they're working on and they're not necessarily paying attention to um, the interactions with their coworkers and what they could maybe do to help you know, leverage that opportunity that that person kind of presented because they have a problem, right? They're really motivated to fix it. Um, and if you could provide them more information around the context of the problem, even if you've already fixed it, that could help them so much more than just telling them to merge master in it and continue on with their day. So let's see how we could maybe reframe this. Um, and take a better approach. Um, and like, first off, I'd just like to kind of build this in as a nice trigger point for people. Like as you're working with teams, when you get questions from people who are maybe less experienced than you or maybe don't understand what they're doing, like, you know, don't just spit out the information. Think about what you're going to say because this is a really good opportunity for you. And one of like the many ways to approach this a little better, um, and I think this is probably the easiest one that most people can pick up is just start asking questions, right? If you know the answer to this, try and get the person to reach that conclusion themselves because they're going to learn a lot more that way um, and they're gonna remember it. Um, they're gonna be able to use that going forward. So for example, uh, especially if it's a bundler error, the first thing I'd ask the question is, what does the error say? Did you read the error? Um, tell me what it says because most people don't read it. Um, you know, and then try to ask them things about like the context of what's going on. Do you understand, you know, what does Bundler mean by this error? Um, what's happening? You know, do they understand like what's causing the issue? Do they understand the underlying context around the situation? Um, maybe then you can even try and, you know, dig into the problem and say like what has changed, right? Most of the code that you're working on probably works in the beginning, most of the time. Um, something has changed that is now causing this problem. Um, and try to get them to focus. Sorry. I don't know what. Anybody? <laughs> <laughs> the screen's on. All right, let me just unplug and plug it in again. Yeah, what has changed? <laughs> There we go. All right, sweet. Um, yeah. So helping someone, um, helping someone, you know, towards the solution. Um, part of that could be narrowing the the scope of the problem. So often, when someone has no idea what's going on, they feel like everything could have caused it, everything in the world. So like, help them narrow it down. Say like, we've only changed two things since the last time this was working. It's got to be one of those two things. Then maybe they could they could follow the steps towards the solution. Um, this is like one of many approaches to do, but I would try just encourage you to start asking questions instead of responding with information. It's going to be so much helpful to the person that you're talking to. All right, and then this is pretty tightly coupled with the, the last lesson is the next one was learn to tailor your responses to your audience because um, everyone you talk to is going to be absorbing information differently, um, and you're not just talking to the same person every time. They all have a very unique um, background, experience level, comfort level with the things that you're talking to them about, um, and you really want to try and hook into that so you can have a really effective teaching moment with them, a really effective communication with the person you're talking to. Um, so one really interesting technique you can take towards tailoring your responses um, is something that uh, Max Lamberg uh, brought up in the Tao of Coaching. Pretty good book, I would recommend it. And this is called the um, Skill versus Will Matrix. 
Um, this is essentially providing a model for you uh, to figure out you know, what teaching approach do you take with a person at any given point. And it's a really nice cheat sheet um, if you're just you know, kind of entering the teaching phase and you're trying to figure out like, how do I tailor my discussion with this person to be the most effective. So let me explain what this means. So the skill versus will matrix, um, you basically have two axes. You have one for scale, which is you know, someone's ability to accomplish a task. The other one is will, so like their motivation or amount of drive to, to do so. Right? You take it, you split it into quadrants, um, and depending on where someone is in these particular quadrants, you can um, you know, figure out what teaching technique is going to be most effective. And I'll kind of walk through it to explain it. So, for example, um, like as you go through your career, you're going to bounce all over this chart at various different levels. I'm going to go through a few of like the stereotypical ones that a lot of people fall into. Um, and you know, a junior engineer is a really good example. Uh, when they come into a company for the first time, they're really excited. Like they are so motivated to learn. They are awesome. They are pumped to be here. And you know, they haven't had a lot of time to build their skills yet. So they're going to be relatively low on the skill axis, but pretty high on motivation. And for these people, you kind of want to take a, a specific approach if they're really motivated, right? Um, with these folks, you really want to try to provide guidance for them because they're motivated. They're going to start to figure things out on their own, but you do need to give them a little bit of a guideline. So um, for these guys, think about providing tools, providing training, um, providing a little bit of a guardrail as they find their way around. Um, it doesn't need to be too overbearing or direct because um, they're going to be able to kind of figure it out on their own, um, especially if they're in the sort of lower skill category or are new in the position. Um, try and remove obstacles as much as you can. Like if you foresee this being a problem and them getting really stuck on something they're not going to know anything about, like try and remove that ahead of time because what you're trying to get them to do is to learn. You don't want them to bang their head against the wall on something silly. So keep an eye out for that. Reducing risk is very similar, right? See if you can remove some of the really big issues that they may hit so that this could be like a much more effective learning opportunity for them. So now your junior engineer is maybe like one month into the job, um, and often they'll kind of fall down a little bit on the motivation scale. And this is because they, they start to realize like how much they don't know. You know, they get into a company and they're like, oh my God, there's so much code. There's all of these different gems. What is going on? I don't understand this. Um, and they start to freak out a little bit. And like, this is very common. And it's just sort of a natural process as you're um, you know, entering a new code base, entering a new organization or career. So for these guys, you want to take a slightly different approach, right? Like they probably have a relatively similar level of skill, but the motivation is definitely decreased from you know, their first day on the job. Um, and for these guys, you want to take a much more direct teaching approach for them. Um, provide very clear explanations of what you want. Um, try to identify motives. And what I mean by that is like explain your logic. I'm making these decisions or we should do it this way because. Not just you know, straight up telling them because it's not really providing a lot of background for them. Help them with the motives so that they can use that going forward. And then lastly, um, develop like a shared vision of success. Tell them what it looks like when you're doing a really good job at X, when, you're, when you've completed this really well, so that they know what they're shooting towards. Because um, without the high level of motivation, it could, they can get a little lost and they'll flounder a little bit. So this is really important for someone in this position. Um, and this will hopefully help them, you know, give them enough direction and explanation so that they can move back up on the motivation curve and get on their way. Okay, and then now you got your mid-level engineers. Mid-level, senior person, right? They're like highly skilled, highly motivated. These guys are great. These are where you want everyone to be. They know exactly what they're doing. They're really motivated and driven to do it. So for these folks, like it's a much lighter touch when you're teaching. Um, you want to take more of a delegation approach to them. You want to kind of open up freedoms and the, the things that they're doing, um, really just you know, provide a very loose guidance as, where, as to like, where they should go. Um, you can you know, communicate trust is really important for folks in this position. Like they often don't know how well they're doing something or how good they are at it. And so really try and kind of bolster their confidence and that can be really effective. Because like, they're skilled, right? And they're motivated, so they're gonna go. So just let them do that. Um, help develop stretch goals for them. Um, that's really you know, important in their development. 
and then broaden responsibilities, right? If you think of someone there, you know, maybe you have someone in mind that's in this position, like see if you can push them even further. Um, it'll help build their skills that way. And your senior engineer. So this happens sometimes too. Sometimes people fall down the motivation curve a little bit. Um, still incredibly skilled, they're really good at what they do, um, but they get a little bored. You know, that maybe they've been doing the same stuff over again, and that they've, they've seen, they've like, been there, done that. Uh, this is really, really common for um, senior engineers who have been in a position for a while. For these guys, um, your, your main teaching approach should just be excitement. Right? Like, you don't necessarily need to teach them things because they're highly skilled, right? They can do it. Um, you really just need to focus on getting them back up and motivated, um, and then they'll be really, really productive. So things like this, um, I would try. And, Point out challenges. Um, there's almost always something tricky or interesting in the work that they're doing, um, and really kind of emphasize that when you're talking to them. Um, identify their interests. You know, what, what is it that they're interested in? Is it functional programming? Is there a way of incorporating that in their work? Um, and then just aligning their interests with their work. Um, so like project allocation and things like that is really important for someone in this position. If you give them too many projects in a row, that's gonna be really boring for them. They're never gonna get motivated again, um, and that can be really detrimental for their progress. So put it all together. You basically have a really easy cheat sheet um, for how to approach teaching moments with you know, any type of an engineer at any level. Um, you basically just have to ask yourself two questions. You know, how skilled are they at this particular thing? And how motivated are they to learn this right now? Um, and then you have a really easy way to approach this. All right, lesson number three. So as you start uh, teaching, as you start building um, your kind of knowledge base of you know, whatever you're working in, some people's default reaction is like they really want to share that knowledge and they're very excited about it, but they often do it by, by just by doing. Um, you often see people come over and grab the keyboard and just start typing and showing people things. Um, and I would definitely encourage people to, like, to resist the urge to do that. Um, if you were doing most of the typing for uh, a person that you're trying to teach, you're probably not teaching them, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, so like, I would just use this as a big red flag um, for people, yeah. <laughs> um, most of the time, they're, they're not going to understand what you, what you typed or what you did. Uh, and even like in the best case scenario, this person's going to wind up back at your desk like 15 minutes later asking you, like, what is this? What did you do? Uh, worst case scenario, they could spend days or weeks trying to figure out what you just did, or it'll lead them down a terrible path. So just try your best to, to resist the urge to do that. Um, everyone wants to share their knowledge as they you know, become more and more senior and just try to funnel in the right direction. So it's a really good point to learn. Are there exceptions? Yeah, you know, sometimes. Um, I would be really careful uh, with the exceptions. I think like the only scenario that I've seen this work well in is um, if you're setting up an example for someone that they can replicate. It's basically the only time. And even then, if you can get them to type it, that's even better. Um, but if you, you really want to kind of give them a solid base of an example and they can replicate it and they do understand what it's doing, then maybe try and you know, teach by doing. But be very, very careful with this one. Lesson number four. So keep an eye out for mimicry. So this is another thing you'll see a lot uh, when you start working with teams of engineers um, is people mimicking code. And by I mean, like what I mean by that is, you know, copying or replicating existing code or behaviors that they see other engineers doing. So for example, like have you ever, anybody ever heard this? Like, hey, I saw this in another file and I copied it over here because I thought it would work. And it does, so I clearly I need that line of code. Anybody? Yeah, yeah, that happens. Um, huge red flag, huge, huge red flag at that moment. Um, if you're working with a professional engineering team, like this is a giant warning sign that if someone has said this or if someone you know, seems like they're doing this, they're mimicking code, um, this is a moment where you need to sit down and start explaining, explaining what's going on. Because if they truly don't understand what the code is doing, um, that could introduce huge bugs. That's going to cause a lot of learning issues down the road because they, they know it's a thing, but they don't really understand it, and they keep using it. Um, so I, I would definitely like 
point this out as a, a really you know, good thing to notice as you start working with more and more people. Um, you know, there's probably a few of you, you know, sitting there thinking like, well, I've copied something from Stack Overflow before and put it in my code and then it works. That's fine, right? Yeah, yeah. We all do that. Um, we, we <laughs> I've done that. Uh, and like that's, that's a part of learning, especially if you're learning a new framework or a new library or something like that. Like there's a lot of hand waving in the beginning, like believe me, this code is doing something, we'll explain it later. And that's okay for a learning process as you're trying to adapt to something. Um, it's less okay for a professional engineering team. Um, and that's the, that's the difference. You don't want people to bring that practice over into your production code where they're putting code in that they don't understand how it works. Um, and try to make that okay for your team members to start talking about. If they're copy and pasting code, they should just, you know, maybe it works, maybe they put it in and it starts working, but they need to start asking people like, why is it working now? What, what is it that it's doing? Um, so it's just another really good thing to keep an eye out for. All right, this is probably one of the most important lessons that I learned is that being a senior engineer is all about teaching and teaching is all about communication skills. Um, it's, it's really, really important and it's something that's gonna be really important in your career no matter which direction you go in engineering, communication skills are, are vital. Uh, you know, in comparison to the computers that we program, humans are terrible communicators. We are constantly losing information when we're talking to each other, when we're writing things, when we're trying to just communicate anything. We lose all of the, the meaning sometimes, the context, the background behind what we're saying, um, and it's really hard to get a lot of the information across the wire. And I think in a more, you know, maybe less nerdy or poetic sense uh, that George Bernard Shaw said is that the single biggest problem in communication is the illusion that it has taken place. <laughs> much, uh, much better put. But I, I would encourage anyone who is uh, going into engineering to really put a focus on this. I think like, it's not something we talk about in engineering school at all. Um, it's not something that I even really thought to put a lot of energy towards um, as I was working with a lot of people. And it's, it's something that I think you can really build a, like, alongside your technical skills. Like if you're a junior, you can still work on your communication skills as you're building technical skills. So like keep, an, keep both of them in mind. Um, and a really good way to do that is to just start, I'm very analytical, so I, I try to measure everything. So I start to measure my conversations, um, especially when I'm talking to groups um, or if I'm talking to my teammates. And I'll say like, I really need to tell this person, you know, how to update this gem or whatever it is. I really need to communicate this thing. I go over there and talk to them about it. Um, and I try to notice like how much information is actually getting across. And you can see this by, um, like, well, by just watching their faces in a lot of cases, you can kind of see where they drop off, where they, they start, you know, stop paying attention or they're getting confused. Um, you can start, you know, asking people to sort of replay some of the things that you've been telling them um, to say if they, see if they could rephrase it, so that, you know, if they understand what it was that you're communicating or if they rephrase it in a totally different way, which sometimes happens. And see if you can kind of build in a few points where you measure how effective of a communicator you are um, and then like really reflect on that. You know, if you had a discussion with someone, you're like, God, they just really didn't get it. Like they did not get what I was trying to say. Um, it's not on them necessarily that like they didn't get it. It's on you to figure out how to better communicate that. Um, and if you just keep doing that on like a daily basis, you're gonna become a really effective communicator because you're just gonna be tweaking and, and improvising as you start talking to people. So I, I would encourage, you to kind of build that into the back of your mind. Um, and this happens a lot in meetings. Um, if you guys do stand-ups, this is a really good opportunity to do this. Um, see if you can communicate to a group um, in a really quick manner all of the important things that just happened to you, you know, the day before. Great opportunity for this. Okay, so we've already gone through five lessons. You guys should be perfect teachers by now. You're gonna be awesome, right? Um, you know, as you start to become better and better teachers, 
Uh, another thing to really keep in mind is to have realistic expectations of your teaching, of yourself, of the people that you are teaching. Because it's really easy to get frustrated sometimes. You're just like, I explained it perfectly. Why did they not understand? Um, and it can kind of get a little annoying as, as you go through this process of like teaching and leveling up engineers. So I would just keep in mind that teaching is absolutely a marathon. It is not a sprint. Uh, it takes time for people to absorb information. It takes time for them to level up um, in, in whatever you're trying to teach them. So just be realistic, right? Um, acknowledge your wins, because there definitely are some. If you're actively trying to teach people, like you're getting something through. Um, so really try and look for those things. Um, there may, you know, the people you're teaching may have advanced in other ways as well that you might not be acknowledging. Um, and try and celebrate that too, right? You're putting a lot of effort into this, and that's a really great feeling when people are learning from you. So just keep an eye out for that. Um, and then kind of above all, don't expect them to absorb everything. People don't, um, and that, that's just okay. That's the way it's going to be. Um, so you can kind of battle this through um, building in different, you know, kind of fixes to your teaching technique for that. Um, repetition is by far the easiest one. Like you know they're not gonna absorb it every time, so try and repeat it. If there's something you're really trying to get across, repeat it over a period of time and they will pick it up. It just takes a while. Okay, and you know, teaching also benefits the teacher, right? It's really, really beneficial to be in a position where you're trying to you know, communicate this to someone else. When you're trying to teach someone else, um, it really solidifies your own knowledge that you have, because um, you need to formulate it in a way that you know, someone else is going to be able to understand. Um, it's great for building confidence. Um, that is like, by far the most effective tool for building someone confident, someone's confidence in like a particular area. Um, and I would you know, encourage people to, to look at their team members and see you know, who could teach something today, because I'm pretty sure everyone on the team has something to teach. Even if it's an engineer that's been here a week, um, maybe they could you know, sit down and teach you, you know, what it was they were doing the day before. Like, there are the great opportunities to open that up to people, um, and it's, it's huge for their, their learning curve as they progress in their career. They need to build confidence in what they're doing, and they need to be able to explain it to other people. Um, it's also a really good opportunity for feedback, right? You can go through a teaching session with someone, and if you've developed a good relationship with them, they can help feedback um, you know, how you could do better as a communicator, as a teacher. Um, and that feedback is also really helpful for you, you know, as a learner as well. OK, lastly, last lesson. Uh, you know, a lot of people probably work for engineering teams. They may have a manager, maybe even just a coworker or a boss. But um, I would encourage everyone to talk to your superior or your colleagues about how you could be learning more effectively. Um, and there are a lot of different techniques uh, how to build in teaching opportunities and learning opportunities with um, the people you're working with. And a lot of the times your management can help you do that. Because it's basically their job to make you a more effective engineer. Um, they're like every day they're def like desperately trying to figure out like how do I make this person better? How do I make them you know a stronger engineer? So talk to them about this, right? If you think that there are opportunities for you to be learning more, um, discuss that with them. And like some really simple ones are often um, trying to find ways to challenge yourself. Um, in a lot of teams, there are things that are kind of exclusively reserved for senior engineers like uh, architecture planning or you know, big feature things or performance hits or benchmarking. Sometimes the senior engineers get to do that um, and there's not really you know, a lot of opportunity to show junior engineers like, what that's like. Um, so if, if that does happen in your org, I would encourage you to talk to your manager about doing essentially a ride along. Um, you don't need to do the technical plan, but you could certainly be in the meeting where the senior engineers are discussing that and you're hearing what's going on, and you have a foundation for how this works. And you can do this you know, over several months and get a really good idea of what it's like to do that. Um, and that'll build a great foundation for you as you move into a senior role. So trying to incorporate things like that, hopefully your management is actively doing that, um, but it's also up to you to like, really raise your hand. Uh, another thing is, is you know, teaching-focused practices. Uh, at Maven Link, we pair program, uh, and that is definitely teaching focused. You're constantly trying to communicate information back and forth. 
And that is great. That is an absolutely like, spectacular way to become a good teacher. Um, another thing that we've been doing that's relatively new, but I wanted to bring up today because I think it's, it's pretty nice. Um, we've been calling it show and tell. But it's basically, uh, at the end of the day, um, our team of engineers, which we usually do teams of five, will get together and they'll review the code that they wrote that day. And we do this every day. And it's sort of like a mini code review process. Um, it's relatively simple. You kind of present your code. We do it on GitHub. We show the, you know, the diffs. And then you see, you know, how do I explain what I did today? You know, how do I explain my approaches? And you have to really kind of present this to the team. And it's a great opportunity to get feedback on how you're doing and what you're coding. And we do this every day. So like there, there's no piece of code that goes 24 hours without someone else seeing it. And so it's really great for people who are learning that like, they can't go down the wrong path for too long. We're going to catch it right away. It's also great to build their communication skills because they have to talk about their code on a regular basis. And that's something that's been really effective for us. Um, also another great teaching opportunity, conferences. <laughs> Uh, your manager would, I, I hope your manager would love to help you prepare a submission for a conference. Really great for communication skills and teaching. Um, and I'm sure that you know, the people you're working with would love to see you kind of advance to that level. It's also great for the company, so it's like a win-win. Um, definitely encourage you to talk to them about that. So I hope these lessons have been helpful. Um, I hope it, it saves you a little bit of time and some of the trial and error that I went through um, as I was kind of growing into the engineer that I am. Uh, and you know, before you move on to the next talks and kind of you know, absorb a bunch of information, I wanted to leave you with this quote that I really like, uh, that is, true learning involves a permanent change in the way you see and act in the world. Um, the accumulation of information isn't learning. So I hope today that you, you learned something and maybe it'll change the way you behave and maybe it'll change the way you see things uh, in your day-to-day -day life going forward. Um, and that'll be worth it as we go on to accumulate more information and more talks. Um, thank you. <laughs> cool. I think we've got time for questions, if anyone has anything. Yeah, yeah. So I'll just repeat the question a little bit. Um, but he was just asking if I had seen um, mentorship be a really good opportunity for senior engineers that have maybe um, been a little demotivated recently, like kind of mentoring apprentices. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's a really great point. Um, I've definitely seen that. Uh, we've, I was, it's kind of funny in the paired programming community, I think it's like the opposite. Sometimes teaching can burn out as well because um, it's like too much teaching. But yeah, uh, especially if you're, you know, pair programming, you're teaching all the time. Um, but for people who solo a lot, giving someone the opportunity to teach enforces how much they know. And that is huge motivator for, the, for their ego and for everything. Um, so yeah, that's a really great idea for, for motivating someone who's maybe a little, um, little bit too stuck in their, their own world, um, helping level someone up. <laughs> yeah. Um, so just, uh, just for the, the cameras. Um, so he was asking, he has two engineers um, that both start at the same time, both at the same skill level, um, but one of them seemed to want a much more direct structured teaching approach where the other was um, much more uh, okay with just kind of going on their own. Um, and yeah, I, like not without knowing the people, um, I would say potentially one of them maybe wasn't as motivated as the other. Um, but it's hard to tell. I think motivation um, plays a lot with different people. And if uh, someone is coming from an industry where they're not as used to being self-taught, um, they're not as used to like digging around themselves, um, that can often present itself in a different way. Um, and I've seen that a lot from people uh, like with academic backgrounds, actually. Like they sometimes want the structure um, in the teaching technique. And they do fall a little bit more into that direct category. Um, where they need clear guidance and um, you need to figure out like what it looks like when they succeed. Uh, it's, it's really important for them. But yeah, it's, um, it's tricky gauging sometimes where they are. But I think if you do try both approaches, you can see how effective they're going to be. And that might actually help confirm where they are um, in the skill versus will matrix. Yeah, uh, yeah. so we have a Salt Lake City office. Um, we're in San Francisco. So like we, we deal with this a lot. We remote pair a lot. Um, 
biggest thing, I, I, my favorite, is um, uh, persistent Google Hangouts for this. Um, it eats up all of your, your Wi-Fi, but um, <laughs> it's really good, though. I, I try to get a camera on as much as possible, so uh, we had... A uh, few people started in our Salt Lake City office. We moved everybody into a room. We had a Google Hangout going all day for both offices. Um, and you can see people walking in another room. You can see their body language when you're talking to them. Um, and that helped a lot. I've seen people do it also um, if they have pairing stations normally. Uh, they have two monitors and two cameras, um, and you can actually put some the other person's video on the other monitor. Um, and you can see when they move their head um, to go and look at you um, in the other monitor, so it's almost as if they were right next to you, and that can really help a lot with the body language as well. But cameras can be a little creepy, but you get used to it. Um, yeah. <laughs> the Hangout's great because uh, you get to see when people with, uh, you know, experience, maybe more senior folks, walk into the room and are sitting next to you, and there's so many more questions going back and forth because they're just like, oh, hey, James, what's, what's this thing? Or, like, what is it? And that, that's, oh, so good. Yeah, I'd recommend that. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, he was asking, you know, if you're trying to guide someone towards an answer and they can tell that you know the answer, it kind of seems like a, a scenario where you're getting tested a little bit. Um, and yeah, that's uh, that can be really tricky. Um, first step, in, and this is a broad one, is like make sure you're in an environment where that's okay, where like the other person is okay with learning. They recognize that this is not a test, this is a learning opportunity. So like that's a, that's a more general answer. Um, for more specifics, uh, I would generally act as if I am equally as interested in the research we're doing to go down that road. Um, like, often when I'm trying to explain something, I'll get them to go into the source code of whatever the thing is that maybe they don't understand. And I'll be like, oh, you know, I didn't know that. Or like, hey, uh, this is also a thing that didn't accept. And like, yeah, maybe I kind of knew in general the answer for this question, but I try and be open about the things I don't know. Um, and that makes them much more comfortable with, you know, also showing that they don't know something. Um, so, yeah, that's a tricky one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's a tough one. Um, replay, replay. <laughs> uh, yeah, because you're gonna, your communication gets even harder, right? Packet loss even uh, harder uh, when you're dealing with someone who's maybe it's not their first language. Um, yeah, the best thing you can do is, is figure out replay and open teaching opportunities because it is sort of a form of replay. So you, you think you taught some someone something, um, and then you maybe try and get them to either teach it to another person, and you can understand exactly how much they absorbed, or replay it back to you. Um, and that's definitely going to confirm or deny it, uh, like whether or not they, they absorbed the information. Um, yeah, that's hard. Cool, anybody else? Nice, awesome. Well, thanks for all the questions. Cool. Thank <laughs> you.